Okay. Uh, we're here at the Robert Arvin VFW Hall in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And as part of the Veterans History Project, we're going to be interviewing, do you like to be called Earl or Gene Johnson? Uh, I go by Gene. Gene? Yeah. Okay. We're going to be interviewing Gene Johnson and get some information on his military career. Now, I see by the biological information, you, you had quite a varied uh, career in the uh, service. But why don't we start when, how old were you and when you got into the service and how did you get uh, in? 19. You were 19, yeah. huh? Did, did you join? Were you I joined, drafted? Joined. Where were you living at the time, Gene? Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, you were living in Tennessee? Yeah. Uh -huh. Where did you go after you joined? Where did they take? What did they send you? Uh, you mean for boot training? Yeah. Or something? Uh -huh. Well, uh, first I went to Nashville, Tennessee, to be sworn in again. Again? Yeah. And then they sent me to Norfolk, Virginia, and I was sworn in again. Ooh, how many times they swear yeah. in? <laughs> I wonder if I know what they're going to do. <laughs> but they kept swearing me in. But then, anyhow, when I when they swore me in in Norfolk. They said, that was it, you're in the Navy now. Oh. Well, I believed it too. <laughs> <laughs> Things sure have changed. Did, did they tell you why you had to be sworn in so many times? No, they didn't. No? Uh-huh. But uh, I imagine it was because the first time was the guy that swore me in was just the uh, a chief petty officer in Knoxville. Uh-huh. And, and he sent me to Nashville. And I don't know who those guys were there, but I took every place I went. They gave me a physical examination. They wanted to make sure I was ready to go. <laughs> so you were in good shape by the time you got to boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you go? What did you do your boot? Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk. Yeah. Is that a big base? Yeah, it's a real. Well, it must be a heck of a big place now. It was for the big place when I was there. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's a real big place now. What kind of a ship did they put you on eventually? Or did you, were you, after boot, were you assigned to a ship? Yeah, after my boot training, I, they gave me a 30-day leave at home. Mm -hmm. And after my 30-day leave was up, they sent me back to Norfolk, Virginia. And then they transferred me from there to uh, uh, San Diego, California. And I worked there in the, the Navy Yard loading ships with uh, fruit and stuff for a couple of three days. And then they put me on the, the Neosis and oil tanker and sent me to Honolulu. And I went on to West Virginia. West Virginia wasn't an oil tanker, was it? No, it was a battleship. Oh, uh -huh. that's, that's where I had my duty at on the West Virginia. It was, West Virginia was a, it was a pretty big battleship. How long were you there before December 7th? Uh, I think I got in uh, Pearl Harbor about About September in forty, in forty. Oh, that. Huh? Yeah, and I, that's when I went on to West Virginia. September, about September in forty, and uh, I stayed on it until the war started. Mm -hmm. What were you doing at Pearl Harbor, and, and what were you doing on the West Virginia at that well, time? Well, uh, the first couple of weeks. They just let me roam the ship to get used to the ship, you know, <laughs> and I like that. So uh, after a couple of weeks, while well, they uh, put me in the fourth division, and uh, then the first thing they did put me on mess cook duty, mm -hmm. and I was on mess cook duty for I believe a month, and then they took me off of mess cook duty, and uh, and then they sent me uh, out to. Uh, I don't know what the place was, but it was outside of Pearl Harbor with about nine other guys to work in the uh, minefields out there to 
reset the fuses on all of the uh, ammunition they had out there, 16-inch mm -hmm. shells, and we were out there for about two weeks. And then I came back, and uh, then they, my boss mate, he just didn't like me for some reason or other. Why not? I don't know why. Huh? <laughs> but that's the way it went, <laughs> you know. Huh. And uh, he uh, put me up on the bow of the ship making a canvas, sewing canvas for the uh, awning for the bow of the ship. Uh -huh. And that was a big job, too. I was up there for about two months sewing canvas. What, what's, what do you mean? What do you do when you sew canvas? For what? It, it was to make an awning for the, to cover the bow of the ship. Oh, uh huh. You know, uh, go over the top of the ship where the where the officers sit and everything. <laughs> and then, then after that, why? I went back to Mexico Beauty. He always had me doing something like that. There was another fellow that went on the same time I did. His name was Johnson too, and uh, D M Johnson was his name, and and he was the. Uh, well, he was one of the uh, guys that my bosun mate liked real well. He liked him, and, and he never did have to do anything, I don't think. But he sure said to me. <laughs> he, he didn't like, he didn't dislike all the Johnsons then, huh? Only uh, no, not all of them. He just didn't like me for some reason. Uh -huh. I don't know why. He just didn't like me. So you were there more than a year before the Japanese came. Yeah, I was there about, well, I went there, uh, I believe it was in October of 40, and uh, the war started December the 7th, 41. Yeah, mm-hmm. So, uh, when the war started, I was on Escook on this cook duty in the 4th Division, and uh, I was, we, we had just cleaned up the mess from the, uh, tables, you know, that the guys were eating on. Mm -hmm. They called it chow then, <laughs> chow down. <laughs> I don't know what to call it now, but they called it chow down then. And uh, they, uh, we were cleaning up the tables and, uh, well, first thing, uh, the guy that was, uh, there were two of us guys that took care of the tables when they got through eating. and. Uh, Saturday morning, it was before Sunday, the Saturday morning before Sunday was supposed to be in uh, the other guy's time to go up to get the water and the bow of the ship to come back and rinse the dishes and things off to send them to the alley. And he wouldn't go. He said, no, he said it wasn't his day to go. So I said, okay, I'll go today. But I said, tomorrow you've got to go. So I volunteered and went Saturday, which made it two days for me in a row. But you're supposed, you weren't supposed to do that. You're supposed to take time about. So Sunday morning, while he had just gone up to the bow of the ship to uh, get the water, or he had left the department, I don't know where he went, and uh, and uh, that's when the first torpedo struck the ship. It was about pretty close to eight o'clock, I think it was. And that's, that, I never did see him again. But uh, what about, happened to him? Do you know? I, no, I have no idea. Uh, there were the uh, warrant boats and mate come through the ship hollering that it's those damn Japs. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And about that time, uh, the general quarters, well, some guy got on a on a loudspeaker and hollered, general quarters, general quarters, no drill. He didn't blow the bugle. He didn't have time to, I guess. And then that was it. So when he said that, why well, we dropped everything and started going to our general quarters stations. And uh, I was supposed to be in the turret number four for General Porter's. By the time I got down there, they had already closed the turret and secured the hatch, and I couldn't get in. So I took took off back to turret number three, and I finally, I was the last guy that got in there, I think, before they secured the hatch. And about that time, all the lights went out, and a couple of more bombs, torpedoes, I don't know what they were, hit the ship. And it raised up a little bit more and set, settled down. And uh, we didn't know what to do because we couldn't see any, and no communications from the outside because no, no power and no lights. They had no communication. You couldn't even see. It was so dark down there, you know. So we stayed in the 
turret for I don't know how long, and bombs were hitting the outside. I don't know where else they were hitting, and uh, that you could you could hear the water coming in around the outside of the turret whenever one would hit close to us, you know. But uh, for some reason or other, they never did break the turret open. So we all decided we had to get out of there. About nine of us, I think, in there. So we decided we'd get out of there if we could. So we started hunting for a hatch to go up to the top of the turret. And we, when we found out, we took off up to the top of the turret. And uh, there was a, a big hole on top of the turret, you know. Not a great big hole, but it wasn't big enough for a bomb to come through. And uh, that's when we could see it a little bit, but it was still dark as a dickens in there. And we started stepping over. I don't know what it was by this or what it was, but it was it, it wasn't it wasn't the deck. But we finally got to the uh, overhang of the turret, and uh, when I looked down to the deck, I seen a sailors down there all over the deck. Some of them were, oh, I know some of them were, weren't alive. And uh, about that time, I, uh, some guy from the Tennessee hollered over and said, get the hell off that ship. So that's when he said that, well, we come down that ladder and uh, hit the deck, and I took off over to the starboard side of the ship to get onto the Tennessee. Were you, were you close enough to get onto the Tennessee? Yeah, the Tennessee was tied up beside us, uh -huh. and and uh, I got on the Tennessee, and uh, I don't know why I did it, but I, for some reason I, I went to the bow of the Tennessee and happened to look over to the side, and there was some guy down there trying to get a whale boat out from between the two ships the Tennessee and West Virginia. <clears throat> so I got down a, a house or somewhere or other, I don't know how I did it, and I got on the boat with him and uh, we got it out into the water. And by that time the uh, Oklahoma in front of us had turned over, you see. We, uh, we went out into the uh, bay where we could see and uh, started looking for anything, I guess. And we, we run across through the mucky, the mucky water, you know, it was all mm -hmm. so dark you couldn't hardly see on account of smoke. But we, we found a couple of guys out there that were really in bad shape that jumped over the ships or something. And we grabbed them and got them on the, the uh, boat and took them down to the uh, uh, submarine base and laid them on the ground and took off back to the uh, battleship row where the sh ships were burning, you know. But it was so the, it was so hot we and it was so much fire we couldn't get up there, so we. Uh, uh, just run the boat up on the tip of Fort Island and jumped off of it, you see. And that's the last I seen of that guy, too. And I got on a pickup truck that was coming around the base, uh, picking up guys and taking them up to the armory to get ammunition and stuff. I jumped on that, and uh, we were on our way up to the uh, armory and we started getting strapped by uh, Japanese planes and they they hit the uh, they hit the uh, pickup truck a few times I think but none of us got hurt I don't think but when I got off of the uh, pickup truck and got in line to get some ammunition and a gun why well, uh, <clears throat> There was a, some officer, I don't know who he was, come up to me and said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm get some, going to get some ammunition and gun. He said, no, you're not either. He said, you're going to the hospital. I said, why? He said, look at your leg. So I looked down at my right leg. My right leg 
was, and the shoe was full of blood. And I, <coughs> I looked up and I, I had a big hole in my knee. Hmm. So uh, I, I started over to the hospital and I got over to the uh, base hospital and looked in and now that place was a mess. There was too many guys in there, their arms blown off and everything else. I said, no, I'm not going in there. So I went out and started back and to and got in line to get some more ammunition, and he come back up to me, that officer did. He said, I thought I told you to go to the hospital. I said, well, they're too busy over there. He says, you, he said, I'll take you over there myself. So he grabbed me and started over there with me. And he said, I'll take you to the front door. And he took me to the front door. And I said, you get in there. And he turned around and went back. And as soon as he left, I, I took off and, and went down to the, uh, the Ferry that was six down across the bay, and I found a rag and just tied around my late knee up there where it was. I got hit and uh, got on that ferry and went back to the uh, uh, submarine base, and they were uh, setting up a tank, uh, base over there to uh, take care of guys that had been hurt, you know. So I got one of the guys to clean my knee out and he cleaned my knee out and put three sables in it and I put a, a band-aid over it. <laughs> one of these big band-aids look like it's about as big as about as big as that, one of these papers here mm -hmm. and uh, sent me on my way. So uh, I uh, went down to the, uh, I believe it was the Colorado in uh, Dry Dock. And uh, I went down there, and it was had been hit, and there were two destroyers in front of it that had been hit. And uh, I got on, the, went on the Colorado and helped them, uh, started helping them uh, clean the Colorado out, you know, taking off stuff off of the Colorado that, well, it looked like junk then. There, were, there had been uh, bunks and everything else that they were sleeping in, you know. I worked on that for about three or four days. But at night, sometimes I would go back aboard to Tennessee and uh, sleep a couple hours on the floor, you know, or anywhere I could. And uh, finally, the uh, Lexington came in port, the aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted volunteers to go on the Lexington. So I signed up and went on the Lexington. So you were, then you were trained, your duty was then on the Lexington? The what? Your duty responsibilities then were on the Lexington? Yeah, then they were after I joined, uh, signed up on the Lexington. My, my duties were on the Lexington then. What happened to the West Virginia? Did it, did it go down or? Well, it's, it, it was sunk, but uh, they finally raised it in the middle of the last of 42, I think. I wasn't, after the, after the election, and came in port. I got on Lexington, and I never didn't know anything about what happened to the other ships in the Pearl Harbor then. Pearl Harbor must have been pretty chaotic around that time, nobody knowing what to do, yeah. where to go. Everybody was on their own. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. They, uh, uh, I didn't know it, but uh, when I went, went aboard to Tennessee uh, uh, that day, a couple of days after the war started, by uh, an officer called me, called me up and sent me down to the uh, dispersing officer on the uh, on the Tennessee, and uh, I went down there and uh, the guy down there wanted to know what my name was, and he he gave me a card and I told him I said put your name and address on this card, and that's all he would let me. And and then on the bottom of the card he let me. Uh, put I'm alive and well wishing you a happy Merry Christmas and a happy New Year and then that's all he let me put and then he uh, signed the card and they sent it to my mother oh. and she didn't get it until February though and that was December the, about December the 9th or 10th when he sent me down there to sign the papers Feel any better today, I hope? 
Huh? I say, I hope the mail's better today than oh, it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you weren't kidding. <laughs> They're a lot better. Most of the time. <laughs> Had you, were you able to get to your mother before that time? That, you know, were you able to call your mother or get anything to her to let her know that you were okay? No, uh, she didn't hear anything from me until uh, even after the Lexington I was on, after it got sunk. Uh -huh. uh, then uh, they sent me back to the States to go to the East Coast and then I called her. Uh -huh. She hadn't heard from me in about eight or nine months. Oh, wow. You were on the Lexington and it got sunk? Yeah. Where did it get sunk? In a coral sea. Oh, uh-huh. That, that wasn't Midway, was it? No, it was just before Midway. Uh-huh. A couple of weeks before Midway. Was it alone? Was the Lexington alone at that time, or no, was it we part had, of a group? We had uh, two or three crack cruise, uh, carriers with us, and uh, some cruisers and destroyers. But they had a big battle, you know. That's what it was, and uh, they just had to pick on Lexington. <laughs> <laughs> they knew you were there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, when it got sunk by, I don't know how. I, I don't remember exactly what happened to me then, but uh, I eventually was transferred back to the States and uh, went on the Thomas Stone and Amphibious Transport in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Thomas Stone? Yeah. What kind of a ship was that? Uh, it was an Amphibious Transport. Uh, no, Troop Transport. Troop Transport? Yeah. It was, they were they were getting ready for the invasion of North Africa, but I didn't know it when it went on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't they didn't tell us that stuff. So. No. Did they get you involved in North Africa invasion? Yeah. They did. Well, I was supposed to be in, but or the, when we uh, we uh, went out and. Uh, I didn't get on the Thomas Stone until uh, just before it left Norfolk, Virginia, uh -huh. and uh, we went out uh, on the way over to the Mediterranean while we outside of Ireland, less, uh, out Ireland, uh, we uh, had a couple of uh, amphibious landings, you know, practice landings. Of course, we didn't know what they were practice. We didn't know what we were doing, but we uh, I was the coxswain of a 36-foot landing craft then. And uh, we had it loaded, had, had the ship loaded with troops, and they would uh, load the 36 foot landing crafts with. We had 21 other landing crafts that they would load on this on our ship, and they would load that with the uh, troops. And uh, then they had a, an officer that was in charge of each route, and he would tell us wh where we were going, and. We had two or three practice invasions there, and then we went to Glasgow, Scotland, and we had a couple more practice invasions. And then uh, when we left there, we went back out to sea, and then about the <coughs> two nights before, we went into the uh, Mediterranean while the, uh, my division officer, I mean, the captain of the ship, he wasn't my division officer, he was the captain of the ship, called all of the boat crews back to the stern of the ship, and he told us, he said, well, he said, fellas, he says, uh, we're getting ready to do the big thing now. <laughs> and he says, I want to tell you, he says, you guys are going to be the coxswain of these boats. And he says, whenever the boat is lowered into the water, and then you get in your rendezvous area, and then the, uh, your motion to come back up to the ship to load your troops on it as you get back out into your Royal V area. And then uh, when you're given the signal, he says you head for the beach. And he says the first ship boat that comes back here without unloading his troops, he says the officer in charge is supposed to shoot you. And he says if you don't do it, he says I will. <laughs>
but we didn't make it in there. Uh, the next morning, why? We uh, we got torpedoed, and uh, the ship just set dead in the water, and all the other ships went off and left us. And we were pulled into Algiers about three days later, and they were still fighting on the outskirts of Algiers, you know. So they pulled us into the dock, and uh, they unloaded the ship while we were all at general quarters. And, uh, Then they pulled the ship back out to the... Well, while they were unloading the ship, uh, they were having bombing, bombing raids, you know, from the Germans and the Italians. And uh, the next the next morning, after, after we'd been in general quarters all night long, why, one of us happened to look over to the bow, over the bow of the ship onto the dock, and there was a great big crater down there with a big bomb laying in it, and it hadn't exploded. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, all they had on it was, uh, this is the best we could do. So, uh, it must have been somebody that was on our side. Yeah, sure. You weren't able to then take any of the troops into the North African invasion. I wasn't what? You, you, didn't, you, you weren't able to drive any of the troops into the beach in North Africa. Because you say your, your ship was dead in the water? Yeah, our ship was dead in the water. And, and, and well, when our ship... How does that happen? What what happened? Well, uh, we were all at general quarters the next morning on the 6th. I believe it was the 6th. And uh, the uh, it was just before daylight. And uh, I was on the 5 inch anti-aircraft gun on the bow of the ship. And, uh, all at once, we heard a plane coming in, and uh, and just as soon as the plane got kind of close by, we heard, heard, heard it drop a torpedo, and as soon as it did, we all started shooting at it. And uh, the captain of the ship hollered through the loudspeaker, says, cease firing, cease firing, that's a friendly, air, friendly aircraft. And about that time, a torpedo had to stern the ship. And then it went dead in the water. So you were, you were hit by a friendly plane? No, it wasn't a friendly plane. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can tell you that. <laughs> That's a heck of a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a friendly plane wasn't a torpedo and then turn around and take off. <laughs> it was a German or Italian plane. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people say it was a, a submarine that torpedoed us. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what it was. I, I know it was a plane. Mm -hmm. I, I seen the uh, sparks from the plane as it as it buried around and took off, you know. Mm -hmm. Spark from the uh, exhaust. Because I was on the bow of the ship and I could see everything that was happening up there. How long were you in <clears throat> Algiers and, and in North Africa before you? Did you go to Italy finally? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> After the uh, after they had unloaded the ship and pulled us back out, the the captain wouldn't let them tie us up to the dock. He wanted them to pull us back out into the bay, so they did. They pulled us back out into the bay, and they were still having uh, air raids. They had air raids for a couple of three months, you know, and uh, they got got less all the time. But we were sitting out there on the bay, and. Uh, well, we uh, had a big storm come up uh, the night, November the 24th it was, Thanksgiving night, I believe that's when it was, and, uh, and it blew the ship up on the beach, and uh, they, uh, they couldn't get it off, and they sent two, two cruisers from, uh, two British cruisers out there, trying to pull it off the beach, and they couldn't do any good with it. And then they sent American Tug and uh, two, two destroyers out there to try to pull it off the beach, and they couldn't do any good. It just kept getting further up on the beach. So they finally uh, decided they couldn't do anything with it. Then they transferred me 
Well, I, in the meantime, I went over to the, uh, after they found out they couldn't get the ship off of the beach, it was still about uh, 75 feet out of, in, off of the beach, you know, in the water. But it was in shallow water and they couldn't get it off. So they uh, set up a base on the on the beach over there and I went over there on the beach and uh, with a with the uh, one of the uh, 36 foot landing craft and seat over there and would haul the uh, people back and forth to the ship you know and uh, they finally sent me up to uh, the What they call it now? Naval headquarters, North African uh, Naval headquarters, to uh, work up there, and uh, I uh, stayed up there for oh about almost a year, I guess it was. <coughs> I had pictures here of uh, of all the crew that they had. Uh, yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to see that. I think I got some pictures here of it. Maybe I didn't bring it. Oh, there's, 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 a, there's a picture of this head. That, uh, that was the Thomas Stone. That's the one they couldn't get off the beach. paper too, you know. <laughs> this is December 6th? 7th. The paper. Oh, this was, this was <clears throat> way after the, the incident. Well, maybe later on I can take a picture of this if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, I'll do what you want to with it. Well, you don't want to leave it with me. What? You, you don't want to leave this with me, no, do you? No, I'd like not, not like to. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any way that I could get this copied and laminized or something. Um, well, we'll think about that. But after a year in, in Algiers, you you then got involved in another landing? Yeah, they sent us to a, well, we stayed in Algiers, and I, I worked at the uh, Naval Transportation Depot in Algiers for a long time. I, uh, uh, did you know a guy by the name of Douglas Fairbanks, Jr.? I've heard of him, yes, indeed. Well, I was his chauffeur when he was in Algiers. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, used to haul him around when he was in Algiers, and uh, I don't know whatever, where he went when we left Algiers and went to, North, uh, went to Italy. I didn't see him no more after we left Algiers. He was in the service, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, they made him a lieutenant commander. <laughs> So you got to drive him around in Algiers? I, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> he was a pretty rough guy most of the time. Oh, was he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. How he, so? Well, uh, I was uh, on a, a duty one night, and uh, he called down to the base and wanted a station I can send out to Mason Curry to pick him up, and I, he was just a lieutenant then, and I couldn't send no station wagon out. They had to be a commander before I could send a station wagon out. So I told him, I said, I'll send you transportation out. So about uh, half an hour later, well, the phone rang, and it was him again. He said, I called you to send me a station wagon out here to pick me up at Mason Curry Airport. He said, you're sending a jeep. He says, I want a station wagon. 
and he sent the cheek back. So, oh yeah, it was raining too. So I sent the cheek back out there, <laughs> and and he called me up again, and he said, "I'm telling you to send me a station wagon out here." He said, "I don't want no jeep." So uh, I said, "Well, I, I'm not allowed to send you a station wagon unless you're a commander or above." And uh, he hung the phone up, and in just a couple of minutes, why well, the phone rang again, and it was the captain of the base. He says, "Is Johnson?" I said, "Yeah." He says, uh, this is Captain so I forgot what his name was. Uh, he says, uh, do you have a station wagon handy up there? I said, yes, I do. He said, would you mind sending out the Mason Korea to pick up Douglas Fairbanks here? here? I said, well, as long as you say so, I will. But I says, I'm not supposed to do that unless I get orders from you. He said, would you mind sending him one out? So I, I said, okay. So I sent him a station wagon out. And about Oh, about 45 minutes later, while the phone rang again, <clears throat> and it was the captain of the base. He said, Johnson? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, can you get somebody to relieve you up there for a few minutes? I said, yeah, I can. He said, I want to see you down here. So I said, okay. I didn't say okay. I said, yes, sir, because I couldn't say okay to him. <laughs> so I went down there, and there stood Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., and he introduced me to Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And he said, Johnson, he says, uh, this is Douglas Fairbanks. So he says, uh, anytime you got a station wagon up her handy, he says, and he needs to say, would you send it to him? I said, as long as you say so, yes. And then I said to start hauling him around. He, he was a pretty bad guy. Hey, in the Navy he was. I don't know how he was at home. <laughs> He sure pushed his weight around. You know, yeah, he, you know? yeah, he sure did. There was a few guys that did that, that really uh, wanted you to know who they were, you know. When did you, when did you get into, uh, over to uh, Italy? Italy? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I believe it was... Well, uh, we, as uh, soon as they, uh, the Germans, as uh, soon as they ran the Germans out of North Africa and ran them out of uh, Naples, Italy, well, that's when we went to Naples, Italy. They uh, transferred our uh, unit over to out, uh, Naples, Italy from our years, the whole unit. And there was about, I don't know how many weapons carriers and half-ton trucks and stuff like that, that that we had over there in Algiers. And they they sent us from Algiers up to, uh, uh, I believe it was Bazerdi. And uh, we stayed up in Bazerdi until they got a, uh, uh, Can you think of what it was? <laughs> Anyhow, it was a. Well, I can't think of a thing. I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come to you later. Don't yeah. worry about it. Were you. Um, uh, did you stay in Italy for the rest of the duration or? No. <clears throat> I. Uh, <coughs> went with the transportation de department in Naples and uh, I was over there in the transportation department for quite a few months and uh, we, uh, I, uh, there were some uh, nurses came in there on a ship, on a hospital ship and I took them to uh, Rome on the, in a weapons carrier for two days and brought them back down to get on their hospital ship again. Oh, I did a lot of things like that, but too many of them to, you know, to remember. Hmm. Were you, were you eventually sent back to the states before well, you were discharged? <coughs> I uh, uh, asked them to send me back. I wanted to go home for a 
and see my family for a while because I hadn't been home in a, since 1942 when the war started. Mm -hmm. So uh, they uh, give me a, a number four priority to come back home to the seats on an airplane. So uh, they, I took the number four priority and uh, went to Mason Curry Airport and called that plane that went back to uh, Algiers. And uh, I took the airplane back to Algiers and, and uh, <coughs> inquired around the, with the pilots over there to see who was coming, coming to the States, but didn't see him coming to the States. But one of the pilots said he was going to Casablanca. He said, I'll take you to Casablanca. So I went to Casablanca with him, or with the, the crew. And, uh, and I stayed in Casablanca for a couple of three days. And then I finally caught an airplane that came back to the States. Well, it was a big troop plane, you know, and it, it didn't have seats like they have now. They were a long ways along the side. We all sit on it, and they had, uh, there was uh, seven uh, Flying Tiger pilots on there that were from Bermuda. They were going home on a vacation. And uh, it was right in the middle of winter, well, in, in December. <clears throat> and uh, we were coming back into the States, and uh, the weather was so bad when we got into uh, New York that they stole the plane, diverted the plane to Washington, D.C. And we got to Washington, D.C. where they said the weather was closed in down there now that they think they was the weather was open in New York, so they sent us back to New York. So when we got back to New York, they said, you can't land here. You got to go back to Washington. So that you might be able to land there. So pilot, I guess he was getting kind of disgusted. And uh, he said, by golly, he said, I'm landing this thing. He said, no, he said, if you can't, 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 can't land. He says, take it out the, out in the water and ditch it. He said, I can't do that. He said, I've got too many guys on here. They said, well, you can't land here. So he said, I'm going to land. So he went ahead and said, make room for me because I'm coming in. And uh, he landed the ship, the plane anyhow, and you couldn't see it. The fog was so bad that you couldn't even see him before you. And uh, he landed it. And when he stopped the plane, he said, oh, I bet we was within three feet of another airplane that was parked there. And as soon as it landed, well, they, uh, they had some uh, officers came out there and was waiting on in the pilot. And uh, they took him off just as soon as we landed. And I don't ever know what happened to him. They must have court-martialed him for landing. But he made it. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get the, from, from there to home? From uh, Washington to home, yeah, I, uh, I, I got yeah, took a train. Or? Took a train. Uh -huh. Went down to Tennessee. That's where I was living at the time. Yeah. I, they get, I had a. I didn't have any certain time to get back to the ship because I mean back to the base because they gave me a number four priority and that number four priority let me go anytime I could make connections. So I, I stretch it out a little bit, you know. <laughs> is, does, do the priorities go, I mean, is four a high priority, is that it? Or? No, that was a low priority. That's a low priority. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You had to go when they had room. Oh, okay. <laughs> So you got home. Was that? Pretty much near the end of the war, or did you go back no, to Italy, or that was a sign? I, I got I got home in uh, in in January. I went I got a leave in January from the base in uh, Washington. They gave me a thirty day leave, mm -hmm. and I went home and I stayed thirty days, and I went back to Washington and they. Uh, sent me on to the USS Columbus. That was a heavy cruiser. And well, and uh, they had just put in in commission and uh, 
while we were out on our uh, shakedown cruises while the war ended. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed on it until I was. My enlistment was up. So that was, you, you enlisted for four years? Six away? years. Six years? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had to stay there a year, uh, over a year after the war was over. Because oh, uh -huh. I enlisted for six years. <laughs> what did you do when you got out? When I got out, well, I wanted to take it easy for a couple of months because. I figured I'd been there long enough, you know. But uh, I went to the uh, down to the employment office in, in Knoxville, and I told them I wanted to get unemployment. And they signed me up and everything, and, and sent me one check, and then then called me in and told me it's time I went to work. <laughs> so they wouldn't send me no more checks. <laughs> so I had to. Get a job down there, and it, you couldn't, you you didn't make no money down there then. I finally got a job at a grocery store paying twenty-seven dollars a week, <laughs> and I worked uh, twelve hours a night. I worked, I was on work on the night shift. I worked twelve hours a night, seven nights a week, for twenty-seven dollars. So I finally, well, I, I before I. Went to the Navy anyhow. I was playing a, in a band down there in Knoxville. I started playing in a band in 1937. I was 17 then. And I started playing a little band down there called Johnny, Ho Johnny Hopkins and the original Tennessee Valley Boys. <laughs> I played with them until 1940 until I joined the Navy. And then when I got out of the Navy in 1946, I went and played with them again for till the first of 1948, and then I came to Michigan, and I've been in the Michigan ever since. Did you go to work for Ford right away in Michigan? No, I went to work for uh, Packard Body Company in oh. Detroit. <laughs> I worked for them for a while, and I got laid off, and then they called me to the. Uh, Beauty wear department in Amdramic, Packer did, and I worked there for a while, and then I decided that was enough. So I came out to Ypsilanti and got a job at the at the Kaiser Fraser, uh -huh. and I worked in Kaiser Fraser and till they closed down, and then I went to Ford Motor Company and got a job there, and I, and I worked in Ypsilanti plant for 30 years. And then I retired. Does now, that man, include the Kaiser Fraser time, or no? That that was just four time uh -huh. altogether. Uh, How many people remember that the the old Willow Run plant was Kaiser Fraser at one time? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think too many people do. Mm -hmm. So how long ago did you retire, Gene? Oh, I retired in '82. Maybe two. Yeah, I've been retired 23, 24 years. I think they're waiting for me to kick the bucket. <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you enjoying your retirement? Uh, most of the time I have. Uh -huh. But you know, there's a lot of times when you, when you get things wrong with you that you can't do the things that you want to do, and you don't you don't like to be bothering people. To, all the time, so my time is restricted, restricted quite a bit on account of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to take a few pictures of the things that you took here or that you, you brought with you. Let, let me ask you a question, though. Um, you, you must have gotten some ribbons while you were in service. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, I don't remember what it was, so I, but I brought them here. Uh-huh. Maybe, we can, maybe yeah. we can take pictures of them. Huh? Uh -huh. This, this tells where they, 
what they're for. Mm -hmm. This one is the Asiatic Pacific Campaign. It just says American campaign. Yeah. European Africa. Yeah. Great. And this is World War II. Yeah. That's all it up. <laughs> that's all. That's plenty. That's plenty. Well, Gene, thank you very much for coming in. I appreciate it, and um, you know you know what we're we're about, and uh, we're most interested in trying to preserve your history, preserve the history of a lot of other veterans. And yeah. This is why we're doing it. So again, thank you very much. Well, I'm, I was glad to come. Good, I'm glad. Okay, thanks again. Okay, thank you. Now. Uh, I want to take a, a picture. Hi,